Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 18, and we begin at verse number 1. A brief prayer before we read the scripture together. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me thyself within thy word. Show me myself and show me my Savior. And make the book live to me. Amen. Verse 1, Luke 18, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Augustine, one of the early church leaders, said, Should you ask me what is the primary thing in religion, I should reply that the first, second, and third thing therein is humility. Richard Baxter, in his manifesto on pastoring, said, It is a contradiction in terms to be a Christian and not humble. I want to say something extremely straightforward this morning. There is no relationship with God apart from humility. There is no relationship with God apart from humility. In fact, according to Jesus In what many observe as the greatest sermon he ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, 
He says in Matthew chapter 5 that the first fruit of a child of God is humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not talking about a physical dynamic, a material absence of things. He's talking about a spiritual perspective, a, a humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. The kingdom of God belongs to them. On three distinct occasions in the word of God, the scripture says in Proverbs, in James, in 1 Peter, that God opposes the proud. I want you to just think about those words for a moment. God opposes the proud. He's against them. He stands resistant toward them. He opposes those who are proud. He gives grace to those who are humble. Pride was the occasion of the first sin. And it is pride that remains still to this day our greatest danger. Now it manifests itself in various ways. Pride can manifest itself spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. But if we were to define pride, it is simply an attitude of self-sufficiency, self-importance, self exaltation. And God has committed himself to opposing it. He's committed himself to opposing the self-sufficient, the self-important, the self-exalting. We have no greater threat in our lives today than the threat of pride. And here's the worst part. It's hard to see its presence in our lives. Now, it's very easy to see it in others. And if there is any humanness to you at all, you've already thought about in these brief first opening five minutes people that you think, yeah, they're pretty prideful. But it's nearly impossible to see in us, isn't it? I think it's helpful that as we navigate how we're doing in life, especially in our relationships, that we frequently remind ourselves of something that I'm learning. There is a me I cannot see. It's easy to see things in others and some things in us. But still, there is a me I cannot see. John Ortberg said it like this. The one pair of eyes into which you can never gaze is your own. There are parts of yourself you will never see without outside help. You know, as a Recovering perfectionist, that concept really bothers me because I want to see what you see. The reality is, however, there's some things about me that I don't see, and I'll never be able to see unless you help me see it. That's the point. There is a me I cannot see. It's so much easier to see the character flaws in others than it is in ourselves. For example, when you yell at your children, you have an anger problem. But when I yell at my children, it's because they're being disobedient. This is the truth, isn't it? The same things that we are guilty of that others are guilty of. We, we, we twist it around. Why do we do that? Because we have a natural bent toward self. We're not aware of our own blind spots. 
We think we're doing fine. And we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt over others. But there is a me I cannot see. So I need help. And thankfully, we have the work of the Holy Spirit to convict us. We have the loving input of our truest and closest companions to guide us. We have the cleansing power of God's word to heal and restore us. Now, we have to get this right, friends, because if we miss on the subject of humility, we miss on the identity of Christianity. So what Jesus does here is he shares three scenes here in Luke chapter 18 to remind us that God rejects the proud and he exalts the humble. Humility is not a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. It's the very premise of Christianity. And it may be that through God's Word and the help of the Holy Spirit, we need help to see about ourselves this morning that humility is non-existent. Well, let's look at three things as a header. First header is God hears the humble prayer. God hears the humble prayer. Now, I want to make another public confession. And that is, this may bother some of you to hear this coming from the pulpit, but I'm just going to be fully transparent. I've not known any other way to be in my life. Sometimes it gets me in trouble and I say too much. Maybe this is one of those times, but I just want to be real. Okay? I find it very hard to pray. I find it very hard to pray. The fallenness of my flesh makes prayer a battle that, frankly, it shouldn't be. And I believe, as we've already laid out, that pride is the reason why it is so hard. Pride can give us a false sense of security and independence as if we're managing everything okay on our own. I've often said that prayer is the greatest form of pride. Or excuse me, prayerlessness is the greatest form of pride. Because neglecting prayer communicates that God is unnecessary. Whether it's in that particular moment in our life in general or in that season or storm, when we are not praying, it's as if we're saying, God, it's okay, I can handle this on my own. I don't need you right now. Now, we don't make time to pray because we have so many things to do. We're easily distracted, we get tired quickly, and there are times when we lack the faith to believe that prayer is actually making a difference, especially when we have gone long periods of time without an answer to a particular prayer. But I want to help us to see some things. No matter how challenging, difficult, and hard it is, God has ordained prayer as a means to accomplish His purposes. And I'm grateful that as I read the scripture, I observe that Jesus knew prayer would be a struggle for most of us. Because he is often encouraging us, like he is here in Luke chapter 18, to keep praying and not let up. Don't don't get weary. Don't quit. Don't let up. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Why? Because God uses our prayers. He's glorified in our prayers. And it is prayer in its purest sense that reveals a humble heart. Because prayer says, God, I need you. Cannot do this in my strength. I cannot move forward in my ability. I don't know how to make sense of everything that is happening to me. So I'm doing what I only know to do. I am coming to you as the sovereign, all-powerful Wise God. So here in Luke 18, we have this parable to remind us that God hears the humble prayer. The humble prayer. So the, the parable, I'm not going to re- read it again, but it has two characters. We have an unjust judge and a persistent widow. Now, the judge is not a righteous man. Frankly, he doesn't even meet the qualifications that make a good judge. 
It's said here that this judge is one who does not fear the Lord, and he's not fair toward people. He rules based upon who helps him out the most. Yet, it would appear that this is the widow's only hope to get justice in a situation in which she's been wronged. So she keeps coming to this judge, even though he's not a good judge, trying to find a solution. But because he's not a good judge, he ignores her, he refuses her, until one day he decided to act upon her request simply because she was becoming an annoying nuisance to him. She wore him down. We parents understand what that's like. Can I have some candy? No. Can I have some candy? No. Can I have some candy? No, not right now. Please, please, please. And 500 times later, finally, yes, just go away. Get the candy and go away. That's the same concept. She wore him down. He was ready to just get rid of her. So he responded and gave her what she was seeking. Now, it's important that you understand that this parable is not a comparison. It's a contrast. Some parables we see comparisons, like this individual represents God, and this individual represents this. Ind- okay, th- this, is, this is not a comparison. This is a contrast. This judge was unjust. He was uncaring. He was unresponsive. He does not represent God. So Jesus draws this comparison by asking a rhetorical question. Verse 7, will not God give justice to his elect? You cry to him day and night? Well, the answer, of course, is is yes. Yes, he will. Unlike this judge, God listens to his people. He has a people. He loves those people. They are his elect, and he has promised to always treat them justly in Christ. So if an unjust judge will give justice for people whom he does not care for, then how much more will the most righteous judge of all sow justice to people whom he loves, the people who belong to him? I wrote down these three things as I was studying this this week, and perhaps you'd like to jot them down. I wrote down here that God is a just God. I can go to God in prayer because he is a just God. He always does what is right. Always. He has never made a single mistake. And he didn't start with you or your situation. He's a just God. That ought to give me courage and boldness as I approach him knowing that whatever God chooses, it is right. It is right. God is a just God. I wrote this down. God is a loving God. You see, unlike the widow who had no name in this parable and was treated with contempt, God knows us by name. We are his elect. He loves us. He's never worn down by our coming to him. No, he wants you to come to him. He knows you. He loves you. He's bothered when you don't come to him. What a loving God. But thirdly, God is a wise God. He's a wise God, especially in regard to his timing. Most of us have no qualms with the fact that God is just and God is love. We may struggle, however, with this part. God is wise. He knows better than me. He knows better than you. And he's perfectly wise as it relates to his timing. He will answer our prayers at exactly the time he knows they ought to be answered. And when he answers them, he will answer them in the wisest way. And he will answer them according to what brings him most glory. You see, this is what calls us to humbly persist in prayer. 
It's the acknowledgement of deep need that without him I am nothing and I can do nothing. It's also the acknowledgement of a great God. That because he is just and he is loving and he is wise, I will come to him in prayer day and night, not losing heart, but humbly persisting, knowing that my God is just loving and wise. Church family, prayerlessness is disobedience to God. We must humble ourselves, repent of our lack of dependent prayer, and pray on. Pray on. Not growing neglectful. Not growing weary. For God hears the humble prayer. We ought always to pray and not lose heart. Secondly, God forgives the humble confession. God forgives the humble confession. Now, in the next parable, beginning at verse 9, we have once again two characters. We have a Pharisee and a tax collector. The, The Pharisee represents those who trust in their righteousness while looking down on others for not being like them. This is the second occasion in these two parables that Jesus has helped us by telling us what the parable is about before giving us the parable. He did this in verse 1. Hey, the parable I'm fixing to tell you is that you'll always pray and not give up. And here's why. God is loving, just, and wise. Now he says, I'm going to tell you another parable, and it's about people who trust in their own righteousness to save them, to justify them, while looking down on others with contempt. So here we have it, this Pharisee and this tax collector. The Pharisee, again, trusting in his own righteousness. These are people who talk endlessly about God, but they actually don't know God. They're not right with him. Look at it in verse 11. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now notice he has a moral righteousness. I don't cheat on my boss. I don't cheat on my friends. And I don't cheat on my wife. That's what he's saying. He has a moral righteousness. He also has a religious righteousness. He says, I fast twice a week. A little bit of study will help us to see that the law only required one time a week. So the fact that he's saying, I fast twice a week, is he just wants it to be clear how dedicated he is to God. Uh, You may only go once a week, I go twice. And then he says, I tithe on everything. But ultimately, he believed that his moral righteousness And his religious ways of living made him right with God. And that's when he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like others. Now, let let me just be very clear this morning. The problem is not this man's righteousness. It's not wrong for you to be faithful to your boss. Faithful to your friends, faithful to your wives. It's wonderful if you want to fast two, three, four, or five times a week. Tithe, yes, all of these things are righteously good. That's not the problem. The problem is he's trusting in it. He believes in all these good and righteous things that he does and don't do. It's why God accepts him. You see, this Pharisee falls prey to one of pride's most deceptive features. God is pleased with me because of my behavior. That's one one of pride's most deceptive features. God is pleased with me because of my behavior. 
In fact, I would go as far as to say is that it's the oldest form of idolatry, believing in God but trusting in myself. Think about it. This man was thanking God, but he was looking to himself. In two short sentences, he mentions himself five times. You can count them there and circle them. I, 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 I. And of course, the self-righteousness was absolutely filling him with pride. Instead of thinking of himself as a sinner, he thought of himself as superior. And that inevitably led to a decision, as often happens in our lives, when we stop viewing ourselves as sinners and start thinking of ourselves as superior to others, we distance ourselves from people who are not like us. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like them. After all, we don't want to be caught with someone we feel will ruin our righteous reputation. If they see me with him or her, they'll think I'm compromised. Did you notice here in verse 11 that the Pharisee was standing by himself? And in verse 13, the tax collector was standing afar off? It's intentional. Jesus wants us to see this, that this geographical posture, it's put on the shoulders of the Pharisee. In other words, this was his decision. This was his decision. He didn't want to worship anywhere near the tax collector. Some would even suggest that he had positioned himself closer to the Holy of Holies. And the tax collector barely needed to be at the front door. That's not me, Lord. You know me. I'm faithful. I don't go here. I don't run around on her. I'm so thankful I'm not like that tax collector. Have you ever genuinely thought something like that from your heart? God, thank you that I'm not like my neighbor. God, thank you that I'm not like my brother-in-law. Now make no mistake, tax collectors did have a bad reputation. There were Jewish people who were in cahoots with the Roman government to profit off of the abuses of the Jewish people. They were dishonest, cheating, manipulators. And the Jews considered them the worst of traitors. But Jesus had a heart for these guys. Matthew was a tax collector before Jesus called him to follow him. And somewhere along the way, this particular tax collector had his eyes opened to his sinfulness. There once was a me that he could not see, but now through the help of the Holy Spirit of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he can actually see the truth about himself. His eyes are open to his pride and his sin and his rebellion against God. And now here he is in the exact same place temple as the Pharisee, but his approach to God was much different. He considered himself unworthy to even lift up his eyes toward heaven, but in a display of repentance, he cried out in verse 13, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Quite a different response than the Pharisee, isn't it? The Pharisee who thought his good behavior would be enough for God to accept him with his head held high. Look at me this morning in my Sunday best saying amen and God bless you and singing out loud and boy have I been good this week. Here comes a man who knows he's a sinner. 
and his head is hung low. He can barely even look up to heaven. He's so ashamed of who he is and what he's done. All he can say is, God, help me. I'm a sinner. You know what's interesting to me? The Pharisee thanked God that he wasn't like the tax collector. But the tax collector was so humbled by his sin, he didn't even believe he was good enough to be like the Pharisee. Did you notice that? He didn't pray, make me like this righteous man. He didn't say, God, have mercy on me if I could just, if I could just be like him who sits at the front. Yeah, that guy. Make me like him, Lord. That's who I want to be. No, 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 no. He simply prayed, please have mercy on me. I'm nothing more than an undeserving sinner. He knew how bad he truly was. He never once tried to excuse it. He never once tried to leverage his good qualities as if God might receive him with his good outweighing his bad. No, he knew he had violated the law of God. He was a sinner how he was behaving, how he was thinking, how he was cheating and manipulating and what he was doing. It was against God's perfect holiness. So he comes to the temple humbly confessing his sin, expressing repentance, beating his chest, and trusting God for mercy. And here's what Jesus had to say in verse 14. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified. Rather than the other. Rather than the other. Again, it's another small detail to point out. But it's important that you see those last four words of verse 14. Rather than the other. It doesn't stop with saying that the tax collector went down to his house justified, period. As if to suggest that he and the Pharisee are now on the same playing field. They're in the same righteous condition that now... You know, the tax collector is justified like the Pharisee. No, he adds, rather than the other. He's emphasizing that these two men, or of these two men, only one of them was truly right with God. Only one of them was justified. Only one of them had his sins forgiven. It wasn't the self-righteous Pharisee. It was the humble, sin confessing, God trusting tax collector. And what is it exactly that justifies a sinner? Justification is a very important legal term. It means God declaring me righteous. God declaring me righteous, right with God, accepted by Him. How do we get that status in life? How can we lay our head on our pillows at night knowing that we are right with God? I mean truly right with God. Not just a few fleeting moments, but forever. Regardless of how many times I mess up, regardless of my mistakes, how can I know the peace of God? I am justified. All my sins are forgiven. I am right with God. I am eternally reconciled to him. Well, that's why Jesus came. Justification does not happen in your own merit. You cannot earn righteousness. You cannot earn righteousness. I'm glad you're coming to church. I'm glad that you want to be involved in the ministries. I'm I'm thankful for all of that. Nothing of that is going to make you righteous. In fact, to do all of that without a true understanding of God, it may make you even more callous to him. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. There's only one who is perfect, only one whose behavior is acceptable to God. There's only one who is actually pleasing to God. Jesus is the one who said, I do always those things that please him. I can't do that. Who might even think I could? But when I put my faith and trust in Christ, when I recognize, 
like this tax collector did. That there is no good in me, that I am a sinning, lying, cheating manipulator, and I don't want to be that anymore. That's the first heart toward justification. No one is justified who wants to continue being who he is. The tax collector's in the temple because he says, I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to commit that sin anymore. I don't want to rebel against God anymore. I want to be different. If that means I got to move out, if that means I got to change jobs, whatever that means, I just want to be right with God. I don't want to be that anymore. How do I do that? Well, the problem is you can't, but one has done it for you. The Lord Jesus Christ, come from heaven, lived a perfect, sinless life, died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and three days later miraculously came back from the dead. And he said, if you would confess your sins, repent of that wayward behavior, and put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will justify you. Not on the merit of what you have done, but on what he has achieved for you. Pharisee walked into church that day saying, look at me. I've been a pretty good boy this week. The tax collector probably had to drag himself in. Didn't feel like he should even be there. And when he came, he made sure that he stood far away. He didn't deserve to look up to heaven. He was humble, confessing his sins, and God heard him. That's because God always hears and forgives the humble confession. Let me give you one more and we'll finish. Number three, God requires a humble faith. God requires a humble faith. That brings us to the third and final scene, beginning at verse 15. It's not a parable like the previous two sections, but it's a powerful lesson nonetheless. It's such an important scene that it's recorded in three of the four gospel records. What we have here is that familiar notion of parents bringing their children to Jesus. It's a beautiful sight. I don't want to belabor this other than to point out the obvious. The greatest thing you will ever do for your children is to bring them to Jesus. To routinely give them the best opportunity possible to learn about him. To know him. To ultimately come to believe him. All these extra things are wonderful. We do them for our children too. But more importantly than that is making sure that they're giving every opportunity possible to know God and to trust his gospel. And that will not happen unless you bring them to Jesus. Now, it's not a guarantee that if you do bring them to Jesus, they will trust him. But it certainly puts them in a better spot than if you just left them at home to fend for themselves and to figure it out on their own. You you want to put them under the voice of the gospel or do you want to put them in front of their social media and television and get them to try to teach them the things of God? Now we have to as parents not let up on bringing our people to Jesus, routinely giving them the best opportunity to learn about Jesus. That's what they were doing. They were bringing their children to Jesus. They weren't sending their children to Jesus. They were bringing them. And for some reason, the disciples were rebuking them for doing so. We don't know why. There's really no explanation here. It may be that they were simply protecting Jesus' time and energy. But whatever the reason, we quickly see that it was a mistake. Verse 16, Jesus called them to him saying, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them for such belong the kingdom of God. Three simple observations. One, Jesus loves children. Jesus loves children. In fact, Philip Graham Riken said, if we love Jesus, then we will love children too. If we love Jesus, we will love children too. And children will love us because they see in us the same love that attracted children to Jesus. Jesus loves children. A second observation is that children can be followers of Christ. That's what Jesus says here. For of such belong the kingdom of God. That is children, even at their age where their mind is still developing, 
Jesus says they have enough. They've been given enough dispensation of grace that they can know me and believe in me and follow me. And then my third observation is simply this. Ministry to children is both an obligation and an opportunity. We fail to do this. We're hindering our children from coming to the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, don't hinder them. Don't hinder them. You have an obligation to bring children to Jesus, and it's a great opportunity in bringing them to Jesus. But here's the main application. It's in the final verse, verse 17, and here's where we'll close. Jesus said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. In other words, unless you in this room who are older embrace the kingdom of God with the faith of a little child, you will never enter it. Well, that leads us to ask the question, what is a child's faith like? Well, it's a humble faith. Children often exercise belief about anything without prejudice or skepticism. And by the way, that's dangerous for you and me. For the most part, our children are extremely teachable. That changes, of course, as the older they get, and I'm discovering. But as little children, they believe nearly everything you tell them because why? They believe that you would never lie to them. They truly believe that you would never mislead them, that everything you tell them is true. And they have no other option but to trust you. For much in life they cannot do on their own. They need you. And they want to trust you. They want to depend on you because they know you love them. And they know you're going to care for them. So with complete dependence and humble faith, what do they do? They trust you. They trust me. They believe what their parents tell them. They believe their parents have their best interest in mind. They don't have to worry. They don't have to figure it out on their own. They trust mom and dad. That's the faith of a child. Eyes wide open, wonder and all, love and trust. And Jesus says, unless you come to me like that, You'll never see the eternal kingdom of God. A humble, teachable faith that knows we are loved by God, that he would never mislead or lie to us, and that everything he says and does is for our best purposes. God requires that kind of faith. Not a skeptical faith, not a prejudiced faith, a humble faith. And the good news this morning is that God humbly forgives those who confess their sins. He also hears the humble prayer. And it all comes back to that one little statement in verse 14. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So I end where we began. There is no relationship with God apart from humility. Let's bow our heads together.